What's up, Sacramento? Today we're talking real estate. We're talking interest rates. Rates are really, really good. Will they stay this long? And if so, for how long? Let's get going. Welcome to Sacramento's number one YouTube channel for all real estate news regarding Sacramento and the surrounding areas. So if that's you, hit that subscribe button and that bell will bring you bi-weekly content. We also go live every Wednesday at 5.30. So tune in, let's get going, and let's talk a little Sacramento right now. So Aaron, what'd you think? We're going to be doing an intro, you and me. We're going to get together and we're going to have that clip. So we do an intro and then exit. Aaron's, Aaron's so funny because he's like me about all this stuff. So he saw that and he's like, oh man, I got the ideas going for this, right? <laughs> got to step yeah. my game up, man. That, that constant go, man. improvement. I love it. All right. So let's talk interest rates. Interest rates are still super low. I mean, what? It was like a five month low last week or something? Like, um, yeah. Yeah. So what's it all about? What's going on? Why are they so low? I mean, not complaining, but just asking. Certainly not complaining. Um, you know, it, it just it all all comes down to, you know, a lot of the like major economic things going on. But the most uh, significant thing as of late is uh, even if you look at today as an example, the Dow Jones, S&P 500 market, you know, got kind of wrecked today a little bit, which that's fine. That happens from time to time. But there's all these these renewed fears, basically, that uh, specifically more so in blue states like ours, um, that we're going to potentially have lockdowns again, or that there's going to be increased restrictions that'll, that'll hamper business. And so, you know, any, anytime you start having, uh, any kind of negative, uh, economic stuff like that taking place, um, you'll typically see the 10 year treasury bond react accordingly. And although it's not a direct correlation, mortgage interest rates tend to trend along with that 10-year treasury bond. So if you're just watching the 10-year yield um, and you were looking at it over like the last four or five months, the 10 year is actually trading at, at, at its best position right now that it has in, like you said, in like the last five months or so. Um, you know, we, we keep hearing about this thing called inflation. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it exists it's it's here. Um, we're certainly you know experiencing it at a at a consumer level in many in many different ways. But as far as you know how the the Federal Reserve and the various powers that be that kind of you know flip the switches or kind of control the the trends in in certain ways, um, they just haven't really been acknowledging that that they feel that, that our country's experiencing inflation. And the, the reason that it's important in whether or not the feds acknowledge it is essentially when, when they issue their guidance on monetary policy, basically saying, hey, you know, this is what we see the economy doing. In order to have a healthy economy, we wanna have X amount percentage GDP, X amount percentage uh, 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 inflation and, and various things. And so when the feds come out every three months, they, they have a, a meeting and they share their, their meeting minutes and the markets, you know, read that very carefully when they, when they look at that, there still really hasn't been any significant commentary from the fed saying, all right, we got a problem with inflation. We got to hike up interest rates. And so between, you know, the Fed's just kind of lack of, of acknowledgement or participation in, in giving, you know, guidance on, on uh, inflation and, and what their monetary policy is going to be, along with, you know, this kind of resurgence of the, the Delta uh, variant for COVID and, you know, some of the increased fears of, uh, of basically some potential uh, lockdowns and how that might hurt business. We've been seeing interest rates, you know, actually trend lower today, for instance, um, interest rates improve by 28 basis points, which to average Joe consumer, that doesn't mean anything, but uh, about 50 basis points would get you 0.125% in interest rate improvement. So just in one day, there's been almost half of, of getting you an eighth of a point. So one sixteenth of a, of a point on the rate, just in a matter of one day. And if you go back a few months, um, where basically like if you went back into uh, January, February, that's when rates started their trend upward. And uh, this is, you know, basically the best it's been since then. Um, you know, who knows how long the party's gonna last? 
all of the experts, including myself. I mean, we've, you know, I've, I've been, you know, a little surprised with how good interest rates are, you know, in the beginning of this year. And even at the end of last year, we were all expecting rates to be, you know, in the mid threes, maybe trending up even higher, depending on how strong the economy's uh, been. But to the contrary, here we sit and, you know, you can get rates in the twos all day long. Um, you know, if, if uh, you know, if you're doing VA or FHA financing or doing like a conventional with a 10 or a 15 year term, the rates are in like the really low twos. Um, so as far as the cost of borrowing goes, I mean, it's, it's pretty much as, as good as, as we've seen it almost in history. So <clears throat> it's definitely a great time to be, be borrowing a, uh, you know, borrowing money for a mortgage. Um, you know, something to, something to, to take a look at. Uh, one of the images that, that I, that I, I got for you there, Mark, was the, uh, the cost of waiting image and, uh, what, what this shows is basically like, you know, today, if you were to get a loan for five hundred and forty one thousand two fifty, which is the conforming loan limit for the Sacramento region at two point eight seven five, um, your monthly payment uh, would be roughly uh, twenty two forty five. And uh, as interest rates tick up, keeping that monthly payment the same you'll see that your buying power actually reduces, you know, so when you get to where your rates about half a point higher than where it is right now, what you'll see is you lose about $50,000 in buying power, meaning that, that that same monthly payment, that same monthly cost or total cost is going to net you 50 grand less in purchase price. So something, you know, food for thought is, I know a lot of, uh, you know, had a lot of conversations with with uh, people that, um, you know, they they uh, feel like they wanted to wait and kind of see where home prices go. Inven you know, in the resale market, we're seeing inventory kind of kind of come back. And, uh, you know, there, there's been some sediment of, well, what if I wait six months or a year to, you know, to see if, uh, you know, home prices settle or come down a little bit? And something that that I would you know suggest to those with that that school of thought is, well, you got to ask yourself the same question. Well, what if interest rates trend up a bit, and you know you spend all that time waiting to save money, and in fact you either don't save anything because maybe rates go up, or if rates continue to you know if rates trend up and home prices continue to appreciate you actually find yourself in a worse position from waiting. That's, that's that whole cost of waiting concept of basically combining the your uh, interest rate that you can get in today's market along with the price that you can get in today's market versus waiting for a, a future date that may have a higher interest rate or a higher purchase price or a combo of both. Yep. Well, here, hold on. Let's take a time out for Johnny's question. Will a builder cancel a contract if you don't use their preferred lender. Um, no, I mean, here's the thing. You, you just want to get, you don't want to get close to, you don't want to get close down to the wire for any of these things. You want to start early with your lender that you want to go to. And you don't, here's where you get, here's where people get into trouble with this type of stuff is they go wishy-washy, right? They go, ah, maybe go, maybe go this way, maybe go that way. Like the thing is early on in when you purchase a new home, you kind of have to decide which horse you're going to go with and stay with them because they're going to know the milestones in the contract. They're going to basically be the person you're, you're, you're going to be working with, whether it's the builder's lender or outside. But the trick of this is to basically have someone you're working with, confidence, trust, good track record, and to get the deal done. Where people get into uh, problems is where they get down to the wire, they start thinking about switching around and everything. That's where people get into trouble. All right, next question. Can you see a 2% or 2.3 for 30 year loans? Ooh. That, what, yes, if you're willing to pay a bunch of uh, points to buy the rate down. But in terms of if if you're looking at like what we like to call par, meaning like you didn't get a lender credit with it and you also you didn't have to pay extra to get that rate, that like par interest rate. If you look at that 
and you go back to August of last year, which was the best that uh, mortgage-backed securities have ever traded, and that was the best pricing that you could get, you, there still was not a 2% 30-year fixed or even a, a low uh, you know, 2.3 or 2 and a quarter 30-year fixed unless you were paying a bunch of points to get that rate or you're doing like an FHA or a VA loan. Like on an FHA or VA, you could get two and a quarter today, no problem. But that's a that's a different kind of financing. Most most people like 80, 85% of all loans that are written are conventional financing. So Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. And on those types of loans, which by the way, is usually like if you're if you're hearing radio advertisements, you're seeing stuff on TV or the internet. Um, usually what everybody's advertising are conventional mortgages. And a lot of times you'll hear, you know, like there's cash call and owning and all these different kind of online lenders that like to just rattle off some really attractive interest rates. But what you'll find is that that's on like a 10 or a 15 year fixed loan. Um, and that usually you got to have 40% down, have a 740 or higher FICO, you have to get a, an appraisal waiver. Like some of them, if, if you need an appraisal, they won't even do your loan. They kind of cherry pick basically the easiest loan scenarios. And that's where they offer that the, the really good pricing. But um, I, I, I would be surprised if we if we were to see rates that low, um, even, you know, two and a half on a 30 year fix without paying points to get it would be a, an, a, an exceptional interest rate based off of what we've seen historically and and the capacity something you gotta you gotta consider as well as you know these these loans even though um they are are you know done through fannie mae or freddie mac um they're not actually like guaranteed by the government they're not insured by the government these are these are guaranteed privately by private companies and so these loans uh you know they still got to turn a profit and so when you look at, you know, the amount of profit that's in a loan that's got like a 2% rate or even like a 3% rate and you build in what the average life of a loan is, which is roughly like 7.2 years is the average life cycle of a mortgage, meaning most people either refinance or sell or somehow pay off the, uh, the, the loan within that amount of time, um, you know, a rate at like 2% or one and a half percent or something like that. I mean, there's, there's just not a lot of meat on the bone for a private company to make money off of it. And so at the end of the day, um, you know, all these, all these companies are for profit. And so based off of that alone, I just, I don't see it feasible that, that rates would go that low unless we found ourselves like in, you know, like we're Copenhagen, Denmark, and we've got a negative interest rate environment where the, the, you know, the Federal Reserve is paying banks negative one or two percent interest to, you know, to borrow money from them. It just the the economics don't really exist right now. Yeah, no, it it, it would be crazy to see stuff around two percent. It'd be nuts. I mean, it'd be interesting, but it'd be nuts. I mean, yeah, that would just yeah. I mean, right now I'm looking at the market and saying to myself, like, you know, the interest rates right now are what it's what it's kind of keeping the market still pretty hot. You know what I mean? If the interest rates were where I thought they'd be right now, the market, I think, would breathe a little bit easier. And I think it'd be more of like getting back to a normal market. You know, a lot of people want the buyer's market. It could be, but not sooner than later. All right, Raj, builders indirectly don't let you shop for lenders, though. They're giving uh, giving less than 30 days, moving in notice for new houses, forcing you to use your preferred lenders or risk paying per diem fines. Yeah, it is kind of crazy. It's a little thing we call steering. <coughs> Man, I need some water. It's too hot. So I would just call people out on their stuff. If, if you feel that there's a little bit of, a, of that kind of thing going on that I would call them on it personally, because that's not like, you know, you know, department of real estate really isn't good on that. So, so I just make sure that, you know, you're calling them on their stuff. I mean, I think that the the lenders who are tied in with the builders definitely have that kind of inside track. <clears throat> but, um, you know, don't be afraid to call BS, talk to a lender, talk to someone like Aaron, talk to a lender and just say, you know, this is what I'm hearing. Is this true? Is it not true? But in the real estate market, especially with what everything that's going on right now, I would say that this, if anything, is a time to call BS on people and to at least 
say to say to someone, you know, like, okay, I get what you're saying. Can you show me the proof behind this or show me, give me written notification about why this should happen. Get it in writing. And I guarantee you, they probably won't be able to do that for you. So just, that's my own two cents. Uh, by the way, Raj, you're coming on the YouTube channel once you close and we're bringing you a bottle of champagne. So that's good stuff. Okay. Sam Golovi, he Sam, you are crushing with the YouTube videos. I want to see more stuff. Great guy, Sam. And you know, one day we'll have you on the show uh, on Wednesday's show sooner than later. It's always it's always open to you. Okay, so Aaron, let's get back to interest rates. Mm -hmm. How, okay, so we know that they're low. We know that you know they change on a daily basis, pretty much. You know, and mm -hmm. we know that as of right now, people are looking at interest rates, wondering. How long is this thing going to last? I mean, like, if you look at someone who's looking to buy a house and they want us, and they're, you know, because here's the thing, and this is kind of a common sense view on it. They're looking at the market and they're saying, okay, well, inventory is coming back, right? So inventory is coming back and they're thinking to themselves, well, inventory is coming back, but interest rates are still staying low. Huh. Okay. So how long can I wait? for inventory to kind of get, get back even more so that I can actually take advantage of the inventory coming back, but also take advantage of these low interest rates. How do you see it? And I know you don't have a crystal ball and this isn't one of those things, but like, how do you see interest rates going up? Do you see them spiking? Do you see them slowly, kind of slowly climbing up? What do you think? Like what's, what's your gauge? Or yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's a great question. And we, you know, it seems like I, I, I get that almost every single day, you know, the, the what, what's going to happen with rates. And although there's no crystal ball, the main thing that's keeping interest rates down right now is that behind the scenes, our federal government through the Treasury is purchasing mortgage backed securities. So like what, what that means is like when when you get a, a mortgage that that loan technically like behind the scenes is actually a mortgage backed security. And that, that security gets bundled up with a bunch of other mortgages for everybody else that, that, you know, fits into whatever bucket that they're, they're putting them into. And, and those loans get sold and traded just like a, almost like a stock, if you will. Um, but on an institutional level, like, you know, you're not going to go on your Robin hood app and go buy mortgage backed securities. This is much more of an institutional thing. But the whole supply and demand principle applies to this as well. And so with mortgage backed securities, the reason that interest rates have been so low is that the feds have created an artificial demand for mortgage backed securities by every single month. Uh, once a week, they're purchasing bonds and, and uh, every single month they've been purchasing at least $40 billion, 40 billion with a B. Uh, mortgage-backed securities every single month. Um, some months they've been buying as much as $80 billion in these securities. And so the thing that's going to cause the, the rates to spike the, the fastest and, and that'll cause the, that trend to start going up is that once, once the feds say, you know, hey, we're, we're actually tapering off our purchases of MBS, you'll, you'll see rates shoot up. About two or three weeks ago, uh, Jerome Powell, who's the chairman of the Federal Reserve, um, he came out and gave some commentary after their meeting that basically, you know, the feds always speak in this like cryptic language. And so all the, you know, analysts, everybody's trying to kind of decipher what what was said. But essentially the, you know, the linguist that, you know, deciphered the feds uh, message was that they do see inflation and that at some point they would begin to look at tapering those MBS purchases. And literally all it took was them saying that they were gonna look at it down the road potentially, and we saw a spike in interest rates for a short period of time. And then, you know, that's that's when, you know, you, you start getting the other economic data that comes in and that kind of tapered them back down a little bit. But once the feds do truly come out and commit to tapering their purchases, we will see that spike because again, they're creating an artificial demand. So once that demand is gone, who, who's gonna buy these things? So in order to entice buyers, you gotta increase the price in order for there to be a high enough return on investment for those, those investors. So we'll, you know, it's one of those things where 
uh, it's going to probably hit everybody, you know, by surprise a little bit, um, you know, because they they don't just come out and you know give you a, you know a good warning on it. It'll 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 happen at some point, and we'll see rates kind of kick up a bit. When it does kick up, though, I would not expect it to be like, all right, today you could get a 2.875% and, you know, the, the feds come out and they, they start tapering and like a week later, it's a 4% or something like that. It'll, it'll be, a, you know, maybe it bumps up to like the low threes, three and an eighth, three and a quarter and, and over, you know, maybe like a six to 12 month period of time, you know, you'll, you'll see um, interest rates trend up, maybe even over a longer period of time. Something to, to think about is, and, and I, I actually, I think about this, this a lot, is when, when we talk about rates, is that as, as a country, you know, as an as a economic system, we've kind of like put ourselves into a corner where, you know, so much of the economy revolves around housing. I mean, yeah. it's, it's crazy how much is tied to housing besides just like real estate agents and mortgage people, you know, it, 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 you know, takes over like it's something like over a third of our economy is tied to the housing market in, in one way or shape or form. And so they do uh, take it very seriously when they're when they're basically doing stimulus or quantitative easing with those with those MBSs, because if, if we do see a, a significant spike in interest rates, Although that could create some opportunities where, you know, maybe you'd see home prices slow down or, or tamper down a little bit because less people can, you know, you lose that buying power. The trickle down economics from that, though, are vast. So it's it's a it's a I, I wouldn't want to have, you know, Janet Yellen or, or Jerome Powell or any of those people's jobs right now. I mean, they got a tough job to try and kind of juggle all that stuff while, you know, basically like not putting us into the poor house by, you know, going into debt forever because, you know, we're just spending money at a, at a pretty crazy clip every single month on those things. But until that happens, you know, I, I just, I don't, I don't see rates, you know, shooting through the roof by any means. Okay. Now three things I want to say. Mm -hmm. Number one, if you guys are like me and you're just like on the edge of your seats, figuring out like if the rates are going up, if they're going down, all that kind of fun stuff, Aaron's company actually sets up all the clients that we're working together on these kind of drips that go out. And it basically tells you exactly how the rates are going up, going down and all this kind of stuff. So reach out to Aaron um, if you want to know a daily update or whatever you want to do as far as rates go, because the truth of the matter is if you're looking to buy and you're thinking to yourself, when's that perfect time to buy? I want to make sure the interest rates are perfect. You need some sort of like indicator on how rates are daily. And, and I'm being honest here. It's like on a daily, daily basis because rates change, trends start to happen, and you need to know exactly how the rates are. And sometimes just popping up Bloomberg doesn't do it. Sometimes you need something to just hit you, just say, this is like this, you know, this is my credit score. This is what I, all my information I got. And this is the rate that I can get right now if I decide to apply and to get a house today. And like I said, Aaron's company does this. So reach out to him, you know, New Way Mortgage, and he can set that up for you. So you're going to know the exact time to buy when the interest rates are perfect for you and all that kind of fun stuff. Now, number two, on Friday in Elk Grove, I'll be participating in a panel of uh, realtors that are talking about social media, marketing, all that kind of fun stuff, how it's affected the Sacramento real estate market. We're going to be doing an Elk Grove. So if anyone's interested, DM me, email me or whatnot. I'll let you know. Worst comes to worst, free food, free, free food and drink on a Friday in Elk Grove. It'll be fun. And I get to meet some people. That's going to be really, really cool that's awesome um, now, yeah it's it, not not bad and then um what's called number three is this wednesday 5 30 i'm actually going to bring on a really sweet really good <laughs> realtor from the bay area and i'm going to have them on about once every single month and we're going to be discussing how the activity in the bay area is coming to sacramento now you might say to yourself wow well, bay area buyers are buying up everything yeah i mean Okay. But it affects the market in Sacramento like nothing you've ever seen before. Um, you know, 
how much is it, how many people from the area are moving over, what's the outlook of people moving in here and all this kind of stuff too. It's going to be something that is going to basically be a good tell in how the market is going to go in the future. Luxury market, any market. So I'm going to have a realtor, a really good realtor. I won't tell you who. This Wednesday at 530, and we're going to talk a little bit about how the Bay Area sees Sacramento. What kind of activity is going on between Sacramento and between the Bay Area? Because I do think that that's something that's a key component in these lives that I'm doing that I think a lot of people from the Bay Area watch these lives and say, hey, we're thinking about moving to Sacramento. Well, I do think having a, a realtor from the Bay Area who's good, not just some schlocky schlocker realtor, a good realtor that I vetted, come on and basically tell you guys what the outlook is, how many people are looking to move in Sacramento, not how many people per se, but you know, how many people are looking with the kind of like energy, the the movement and everything to, to Sacramento, because it's going to tell a lot about how our markets can be doing in the future. All right. That's smart. Now, Wednesday, 530, 530, same bad time, same bad channel. Okay. I think <laughs> you guys heard this. When I go through a new builder and go with their loan company, a month later, can I turn around and refinance the house and go with the closing costs they cover to pay for the refinance after I move into the house? That's an Aaron question. You you could actually refinance the day after your transaction closed. You don't have to wait a whole month. But yeah, you, you could refi right away. There's nothing uh, holding you back. There's no prepayment penalties. Um, so it, it just comes down to, you know, you qualifying for, you know, that, that next loan, um, which... Uh, you know, we, we have seen a lot of people uh, do that strategy where basically the builder, for whatever reason, because um, it kind of varies. We've seen some builders where they barely give a, an incentive. And then there's some that for whatever reason, they've got like a I talked to one lady the other day that she was getting a three percent incentive. I mean, that's a that's a pretty big chunk of change, especially on she was like it was like a million dollar purchase. So for her. Um, it totally made sense to take that credit. And then literally as soon as her loan closes, she's going to refinance with us and get a significantly lower interest rate because, you know, there's no free lunch, right? So at the end of the day, you know, a lot of times when that, that credit, that big credit gets built into it, that big incentive, well, you see it offset by a, by a higher market rate than what you could get with just a, a regular, regular loan. So yeah, you could do that, Christian. As Steve Miller said, go on, take the money and run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, but talk to Aaron off, off, um, offline too. Give him a call and he can fill you in on the details on how to get it done too. Um, there's always a process to these things and he can make sure that, um, that it gets it done and all that kind of fun stuff. So Aaron, this weekend, what was it for you? How is, it, how is the market feeling to you? You know, it's uh, I, I feel like a lot of buyers because we have lots and lots of people that have already gotten pre-approved with us and they're out, you know, fighting with everybody else to, to find a house. And, you know, if if you go back a couple of months, I feel like a lot of people were just getting fatigue. You know, they, they're getting kind of beat up. And, you know, although it's ridiculously hot outside, um, a lot of people, you know, ever since June 15th, when our state opened back up and people were, you know, allowed to go back out into the world and, and, and do things, you know, travel's just been through the roof. And so, you know, between that and probably, you know, just other extracurricular things like like my my brother in law, you know, their kids every single weekend, Saturday, Sunday, they're in traveling soccer now because that's all open back up. So you know, if they were potential home buyers right now, their weekends are kind of sucked up with with that. They're not focused on buying a house. So what I have seen is um, a, a lot of the buyers that are still in the game and still focused, um, they, they kind of have a, a renewed energy, uh, you know, a renewed, you know, positive glow, if you will. And we're seeing more people get into escrow um, because there are more opportunities than there were a few months ago, just for, for various reasons. We are seeing a little bit more inventory come back on the market versus a few months back when, you know, it's kind of like the Dutch tulip craze where every, you know, there's just like this buying frenzy and people are just buying whatever they can get without really, without really going through due process. And so um, it seems like a little bit of the crazy settled down and that being a buyer is becoming easier um, which is nice because with interest rates where they are right now, um, it's, you know, like we keep saying, it's a great time to buy. 
Um, so I, I, I'm very optimistic for the, uh, the rest of the, the buying season. And it'll be interesting as well to kind of see what happens as we get back into the fall. You know, traditionally we have Labor Day weekend and then everybody goes back to school and then you got Halloween. And then all of a sudden, you know, in the real estate industry, it's like the sidewalks get rolled up and everybody goes dormant until like after New Year, typically. Um, but this last year, um, with all the crazy things going on and the high demand for housing, because um, a lot of the you know COVID restrictions and all that stuff, the whole winter, uh, all through the holiday season and everything, it was just a you know it was a, a zoo. So it'll be interesting to see kind of what happens uh, as far as all that stuff goes. Um, but I, I think it's a it's a great time to be buying a house. Yeah, I ain't sweating this market at all my mm -hmm. clients or whatnot. I, I think this is a much easier market than it was like, you know, three, six months ago. Um, yeah. I think Elk Grove is still brutal, <laughs> but it means something's never changed. I Elk think Grove's always been brutal though. Always you know? been brutal. So you got your traditional markets, but for the most part, I don't know. I mean, I think people right now, I think the sellers who are listing their houses, I think they're listing them a little higher. And I think we're seeing stuff sit on the market a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, like I tell people, I'm like, look at Wednesday. Wednesday is a great day to look at, this, at those houses that maybe were listed a little too high. Those are the houses where I do think that not every house is going to be waiving the appraisal contingency is in going big. I do think that sellers are listing the, a lot of almost every seller listing their house. <laughs> it's pretty much listing their house for like, you know, a lot of money. And I think on Wednesday when those houses have already endured that weekend rush, I think you can get a deal on them. I'm not sweating this market at all for my clients. I think my team specifically, we've been knocking them out. Like, so for mm -hmm. me, like this market right now, um, and I'm telling you this, cause like, we're like, basically today we're closing a, our, one of our listings. We're closing a buyer who just had a baby the week before too. So it's like I, this market for me is, is right now, not, I'm not sweating it at all. You know, like the one that was maybe three months ago, six months ago, that was the one that was tough. That was the one like, Oh God, how many offers this and that. This market, not so much. Um, if you're buying in luxury space, I think, I think this is a great time to do it. I think you are going to see things that are priced way high that are sitting. I think the luxury market, you're seeing that. I think now, over the last like week or so, you're seeing the seven, eight hundred thousand dollar houses um, get hit with that as well. They're kind of sitting a little bit longer than they should. So I do think, for the most part, that like the market is a lot easier of a market. Um, like I said, we're not having issues with our clients. We're putting them in and, you know, it's not as bad as, I mean, of course, we're giving worst case scenarios to the clients because our team's motto is to under promise and over deliver as opposed to, you know, over promise and under deliver. So that's it. But this market, I'm liking it so far. So good. And if it continues down this road, I'm liking it towards the end of this year. I think, I think for people who are, you know, looking to buy, I think this is a good market. I think be picky, but know what you're after. And I think this market will deliver you some great houses. So, so I would stay tough. Um, okay. Raj, with lumber prices falling this past month and slightly more inventory, why are new homes prices still rising? Oh, for lumber last week, woo, lumber went down. Oh my God. Lumber went down. Okay. Here's the thing about new home builders right now is they've slowed down. They've downshifted from fourth gear to second gear right now because they at the same time are wondering how far material prices will drop. So they don't really want to buy the material prices at this, at this price they're even at right now. They're waiting for it to drop down mm -hmm. further. So what you're going to notice is home builders are kind of slowing, slowing down even more than they were before. And so that they're, they're, they're reassessing everything as well too. I mean, they kind of have to, I'd say right now is the inquiries are down, um, for new homes. I'd say all across the chart, they're, they're still a little down from vacation people leaving on vacation. So I think the re new home builders are right now reassessing right now, where, where are the materials going to land? Are they going to, how far are they going to drop when they should buy? Um, they're going to assess their costs for building and then they're going to, probably figure out what they were charging supply and demand go forward. So right now I think they're in like a big huddle trying to figure out where this is going to land because truthfully the way lumber has been dropping and materials have been dropping, you know, it's, it's nuts. I mean, our biggest next crisis is going to be, you know, contractors. I mean, they're already contractors. God love them. They're charging a, a boatload, you know, and now that boatload is going to seem cheap 
compared to probably what they're going to be charging over the next couple of months as well. So that's going to be our next big crisis um, as far as contractors. If you have a good contractor, if you got a neighbor that's a contractor, bring them a box of cookies, make them your best friend because contractors <laughs> are going to be the it thing, the it thing from, from now until probably at least the end of the year. What do you think, Aaron? Yeah, absolutely. The labor shortage has been the, the biggest problem. I, I was actually reading a, 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 maybe a month ago, a few weeks back, uh, uh, specifically about the the lumber. And uh, it was an article uh, interviewing a couple of CEOs of major lumber corporations in the U.S. And they were they were basically uh, conveying that uh, with a lot of the builders, um, the builders actually lock in future pricing for their lumber. And so a lot of the builders, it was kind of ironic that you got all these builders out here saying, you know, hey, we got to jack these prices up because, you know, the, the lumber is going up. But behind the scenes, it's very likely that, well, they already bought their lumber, you know, back in 2019 before the prices went up. Because a lot of these lumber mills, these big companies are actually taking huge losses due to the the commodity price change and where they locked in. In fact, they've actually uh, changed, uh, these companies changed their policy on allowing these builders to, to lock in those future prices. So I think that just like a lot of businesses, when, you know, they, they uh, take some big losses, when opportunities come for them to make up for that and, and reap some big profits and rewards, you'll see a lot of these uh, prices swing to where you know the the builders will be ratcheting up their price and then that'll get passed on to the builders um but the 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 lack of of labor i think is the biggest problem i mean at the end of the day if you don't have guys to go out and swing hammers and do electrical and plumbing and all the you know hundreds and hundreds of things that that need to take place in order for that house to be completed there's no house to buy um and you know people are having a hard time getting, you know, and these are really good paying jobs, um, having, you know, a hard time getting people just to come in for, for basic, uh, you know, some of these basic roles. So it's going to be interesting. I think a lot of that will be tied to partially with uh, what our state and the feds, you know, end up doing with the long-term unemployment, um, you know, uh, stipends that, that, that have, you know, continuing to go out and that are causing, you know, some businesses, some heartache with, with hiring folks. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, hey, do you know what's actually kind of interesting? It was funny is, um, I know some friends of mine who do real estate up in the Portland area and Portland, I guess is completely like, I mean, the hate that's going in Portland, it seemed like all the hate that was going in Sacramento shifted to Portland <laughs> because now Sacramento is getting a lot of love. I mean, like, I'll say this to the people who bought, the people who are thinking about buying in Sacramento or the, you know, El Dorado, Roseville, Rockland, you name it. Um, you're hedging your bets pretty nicely. I think Sacramento has always been one of those areas that people have completely underestimated. I think that a majority of people, when they come out here and they look at some amazing stuff, um, they're blown away with the price point even now. You know, the, the, the location, you go up to Serrano, you see Folsom Lake, you go up to Whitney Oaks, you play some golf, you hang out, you go food, shop, you know, you go get some food and everything. I think Sacramento is one of those places that I can honestly tell you this, Aaron, I've showed people who basically have told me straight up, we're in the Sacramento area. I don't know if Sacramento is for me. Can you show me around a little bit? And by the end of the tour, they are like, talking, getting pre-approved, they're all set to go because Sacramento completely changed their mind. So I do think Sacramento is right now on the on the ground floor of doing some, some amazing things. I think the people who bought their houses in the Sacramento area, whether it be Rockland, Roseville, El Dorado Hills, Lincoln, or whatever, I think we're in for one heck of a ride. I think you people who bought hedged your bets to a good city. I think we have a nice thriving economy. Our downtown area is going to be just on 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 the rise and has anyone noticed though and and tell me this is okay the hate that was being generated about sacramento is somewhat gone have you noticed yeah. that Eric? Yeah, yeah 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 no one said negative stuff about sacramento i mean now i mean maybe you'll get now one or two people who after seeing this video might well but yeah you're gonna start the movement no nah, it's not that it's like people are seeing what they can get here they're seeing that they're an hour and a half from tahoe hour and a half from Napa, hour and a half from Sonoma, near lakes. Uh, they can go horseback riding. They can go, you know, do whatever they want to do here. We got lakes. We got, 
you know, you're close to Stinson Beach, Marin County, like a couple hours away. You're close to the Bay Area, San Jose, two hours away. So for me, man, I'm loving this whole Sacramento thing. And the market now, oh, yes, it's getting better. And I'm feeling it because now I don't have to have those depressing conversations with buyers um, about appraisal, $70,000 over appraised value and everything. Mm -hmm. And now my luxury buyers, too, are loving it because they're seeing stuff sit. And it's a little bit more opportunity for them as well. So this market for me, I'm loving it. And I'm loving Sacramento right now as far as all the opportunities it's providing um, people moving into this area. It's, it's pretty cool. You know, soapbox, now I'm getting off. Next question. The builders prefer lenders to give us an additional uh, $600 closing cost credit for not requiring appraisal on our homes. But isn't appraisal in the interest of the buyer? Aaron. Uh, so basically what's going on in your scenario there is that Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, if you're putting a 20% down payment on a purchase loan, um, basically their algorithm, this computer program that all applications go through, it'll, it'll decide if an appraisal is needed for your transaction. Um, and if it's not, then it basically, it speeds up the process. It makes it faster, which means it costs less to produce your loan, which is why you'll see that like the, you know, lender will, will do it at a discounted service um, in order to, to, you know, make that happen. You know, is it, uh, are you doing yourself a disservice by not getting an appraisal done? Um, I mean, you, you could kind of argue both ways on that, but at the end of the day, um, you know, the bank's only going to lend based off of, of either what the algorithm thinks the home is worth or what the appraisal uh, says that the home is worth. The algorithms <clears throat> are decided based off of basically Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they're, they're collecting data. And every time a transaction closes, um, they're, they're, you know, mining that data. And basically, they're, you know, a lot of the appraisals that are done these days, um, although an appraiser goes out to the property and takes pictures and all that, like 90% of the work is done, you know, behind the scenes, it's all pulled off offline. And so they have a really good idea of what it's worth. I would assume that if you're in a new build development and, uh, you're, you're in a position where you're getting an appraisal waiver, that means that enough other new homes in that area have sold to provide enough data for Fannie or Freddie um, to, you know, basically give you, um, you know, that appraisal waiver. But I'd ask this question as well as, you know, let's say that, you know, I don't know what your purchase price is, but let's say that your purchase price is $700,000. Um, if, if you were to get an appraisal and the appraisal came in at six ninety, dollars um, do you still want the house? Because uh, if, if the, the answer is yes, um, then you're going to have to come up with that $10,000 difference in addition to the 20% down or whatever down you were putting um, in your scenario. So, you know, if you if you feel kind of sketch on the value, I, I could certainly see, you know, doing your due diligence and feeling that an appraisal may be, may be worth it. Um, but, you know, if you're going to buy that place, hell or high water, and, you know, that that, you, you know, regardless of if it's 10 grand off or five grand off or whatever, um, you're probably better off just taking the lender's uh, appraisal waiver, um, saving yourself the fee for the appraisal because you're going to pay around 500 bucks for an appraisal. Plus on new builds, um, the appraiser has to go back out at the end when the home is ready for occupancy. They got to reinspect it and that costs usually another 150 bucks. So between saving yourself on that cost and then you're saying that the lender is willing to give you another 600 bucks towards your closing, you know, you're looking at a, at a swing of $1,200. Um, and if you're going to be buying it, regardless of if it's off by five, 10 grand or whatever, you'd probably be better off taking that, that waiver. Yeah. I'm, and here's the thing, Raj, for me, one of the things that I was like, it's kind of left a bitter taste in my mouth is the idea for appraisals, you know, like, um, you know, when I first got into real estate, you know, I'd be closing a deal and the house price was 505, you know, and the appraisal would come back at 505, you know, I'd, you know, 610, 610, 609, 609. The appraisal came back. So like, you know, just so you know, too, it's like the appraiser gets a shot of what the house contract is. So, you know, 
will it differ from a third party appraisal? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, you know, take it also with a little bit of grain of salt with the appraisals. They're a little interesting, I guess you could say. I mean, when you know the price you're kind of supposed to be appraising it for, it just, it just is, in my opinion, there's a little bit, you know, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think about that, Aaron? Well, it, it, when it comes to an appraisal, the, the thing a lot of, you know, people don't consider is that an appraisal is just the opinion of that appraiser. Meaning that like technically, if I were to send 10 different appraisers out, which nobody does that, but if, if you were to send 10 different appraisers out to appraise the property, it's, it's you know, possible that you get 10 different appraised values, um, you know, because this one had the opinion of this, this one had the opinion of that. There's, uh, without going too far in the weeds, there's basically some, some room for the opinion of that appraiser where when they're pulling the comps and, you know, this house sold for X amount of dollars, this house sold for X amount of dollars. Well, they make little minor adjustments based off of square footage, bed, bath count, lot size, quality, you know, all sorts of things that ultimately, you know, where it ends up being 701 or 705 or 710 or whatever. So, you know, it, appraisals can be frustrating because, you know, uh, sometimes you know that the value is, you know, much higher than what you're getting on the appraisal. But for whatever reason, that appraiser is sticking to this comp that's two years old, or, you know, there's, there's sometimes some funky things that come out of it. When, when in our office, about 60%, um, maybe even closer to 70%. Last time we looked, it was like in the middle, 67%. But roughly like 60% uh, of our applications that go through do not need an appraisal. Um, and it's just basically because either they're refinancing and have 10% or more equity or they're purchasing and putting 20% or more down and doing a, a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan. It makes the process way faster, which even on a new build, although you're not under the gun like you can be on, this, on the resale market, um, you know, you're just removing additional parts of the of the process. Like, you know, if you looked at it like an assembly line, you just chopped out a chunk of that assembly line. So there's less cost for you, less cost for the lender, less time for you, less time for them. So, um, you know, un unless you're just really leery about that appraised, you know, what the value is, I'd, I'd, I'd stick with that waiver because you're, you're probably going to be better off with it. Yeah. The other thing too is, Aaron, have you ever seen an appraiser appraisal get overturned? Okay. I had, and this is just in recent experience. I mean, I didn't been doing this for about 20 years. So over time, there's been different scenarios, but in recent years, um, like in the last 12 months, we've only had one situation where we got an appraisal and the value came in low and we were able to rebut the, the findings. Um, and, and the process basically is, um, you know, we have to uh, go back to the appraiser and provide them with the comparables that we felt that they should have used uh, compared to what they used or question the adjustments that they made versus what we felt should have been made. Um, and, and we've rebutted a lot of appraisals we only had one get overturned, meaning that the appraiser agreed with us and, and changed the value. And in that scenario, I remember it specifically because it was, you know, you, you lose sleep over some of these things when it happens. And uh, in that scenario, for whatever reason, the appraiser wasn't using a comp that like just sold like a day or two before he did the report. And so I don't know if, if when he pulled his comps originally, you know, maybe he did it before he went out and did the inspection and it just wasn't there yet or whatever. But that was the only scenario that um, basically the appraiser felt that they didn't have all the info when they did their report. And when we provided new info, they felt that it justified an increase in value. All the other scenarios that we've had, um, and there's been quite a, quite a few, um, Every, every single one of them, the appraiser basically has come back and, and said, you know, kind of too bad, so sad. I, I still feel that, you know, whatever <laughs> amount I gave you is, is the correct amount. And there's, there's, no, there's no recourse after that. I mean, you can't, um, you could 
uh, you know, as a, as a broker, for instance, we're not tied to one lender, New Way Mortgage. We work with multiple lenders. So one of the benefits sometimes is like if things go sour with one lender, well, we can just switch and go to a different lender and you'd be surprised what one lender will take versus the next. And, you know, you get another appraisal. But in a lot of times when you get a bad appraisal, it's it's not that it's necessarily a bad appraisal, meaning like the appraiser didn't do a good job. It's more that the uh, valuation methods that appraisers use, because they kind of they have a it's uh, a standardized procedure, USPAP, and they they all you know follow the standardized procedure. So it's very unlikely that this one appraiser is just this rogue you know agent and and is way off on things, and so. Most of the time, if one appraiser is, is you know, feeling that it's in this kind of ballpark on price, a lot of times if, if you had another appraisal, it's probably going to be somewhere around in that area. We, we don't see like massive uh, discrepancy between values a lot of times. Even if you go back like a few years ago when uh, the flips first started happening, um, meaning like you'd buy a house through a foreclosure or, you know, at the auction house and then they'd fix it up and flip it immediately. Um, back when, when that was becoming a big thing, lenders came out and said, all right, if you've owned the prop, if the property has been owned for less than 90 days, the person selling it, you got to get two appraisals, just standardized, you know, that's just the way it goes. So it became very common to where in a transaction, you'd get two appraisals. Um, and you'd be surprised at, although they, they were very rarely the same exact price. Um, although it is kind of funny how appraisers seem to, uh, a lot of times appraise it for the exact sales price in the purchase contract because they, they get a copy of the purchase weird. contract. Yeah. It's, it's, it's weird how that works, <laughs> but, but it was never like, you know, well, this one came in at 500 and this one's 600. It's always like, you know, there, this one's 500 and this one's 505 or, you know, there's not a big, big discrepancy. So, yeah, I mean, appraisals are crazy. I, I guess the main reason was I was watching this one realtor on YouTube and he was saying it like, Oh yeah, you can just refute. You can rebut like an appraisal. Like it, like it happens every day. And I was like looking at this going like, seriously, you're just going to be giving all these people false hope. Another thing too, guys, if you are watching YouTube videos and you're watching realtors, try to figure out how many transactions a realtor actually has done um, before, you know, putting validity on what he's saying. Because half the time I'm seeing these realtors online talk about this and that, they aren't closing nearly any deals. So just keep in mind, it could be all smoke and mirrors. So just kind of Pay attention to who you're paying attention to. Okay. Mm -hmm. Number two, why would anyone choose a builder's preferred lender, even with $10,000 or so credits offered? I noticed these builders lender charge crazy high fees, especially canceling out any credits offered. Aaron, question? You know, the, I mean, in, in most of these scenarios, the builder either owns the mortgage company or behind the scenes, they have a joint venture where they own part of it and like, like as an example, TriPoint, their their lender, TriPoint Mortgage or TriPoint Connect or whatever they call it, TriConnect, um, that's a joint venture between Loan Depot and TriPoint Builders. And so they they co-own this mortgage company together. Well, at, at the end of the day, all these businesses, they're in business to, to make money. And so, you know, although the builder incentive that that whatever it is, you know, the one percent or two percent, three percent, whatever it is that they're throwing out there, um, it's it's got to come from somewhere, right? And so, a lot of times, what you'll see is part of where they they get the the money back on that is they they have an underwriting fee, a processing fee, an admin fee, a rate lock fee. You know, the fees just start adding up to where you know it, it kind of takes away from that credit. And then when you factor in the higher interest rate on top of that, um, you know, a lot of times that that, you know, credit is is eaten up completely between the two. It's it's not a system that's set up to give you a better deal. It's a system set up to streamline the process and to create more opportunities to make money for for the builder. So, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of how that, that setup is. So, you know, definitely shop around. I mean, if the builder, you know, owns the insurance company, 
Um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me that if you went and shopped homeowners insurance with other, you know, providers that you may get a better deal somewhere else, but you know, you may have to work with multiple people versus like it all being a one-stop shop. And, you know, you just go into ABC builder and you work with ABC mortgage and ABC insurance and so on. Yep. Yep. I would say also always do the Pepsi challenge. And if you, if you're looking at something, it costs you nothing could save you. It's not a commercial that I'm repeating, <laughs> but basically, you know, why not? Right. Reach out to Aaron. As you see, he's really, hey, or bring it here, bring it here and talk to us about this while we go live. Sure. Uh, so as we come to an end of another live here, we have basically the points of interest right now, are the fact that interest rates are really, really good. Inventory mm -hmm. is slowly coming back and uh, houses are kind of sitting. There's not a lot of, there's not as many multiple offers as there were before. Luxury market is a little bit getting, things are staying on the market longer. 7,800, same kind of thing. Elk Grove is still a terror, super competitive. And, um, and that's it. Anything else to add? Have I missed anything, Aaron? Uh, you know, I, I was just going to say after your show this Wednesday, 630, uh, Jennifer and I, we're going to be talking about uh, how to buy a house with less than 20% down. There's all sorts of myths behind that you got to have 20%. We're going to bust those myths and go into detail on how you can, uh, you know, put as little as zero down, uh, depending on what kind of loan you're doing in, in your particular scenario. Also, one other thing, if you are somebody that's interested in getting rate updates, uh, you can text the word rate to 916-465-6639 or email the word rate to hello at newwaymortgage.com. And we'll reach out to you and just get a couple of pieces of information. We don't need to pull your credit or anything crazy like that, but we just need to know your scenario essentially. And then we'll basically plug you right into the live pricing engine and every day the the, the program will uh, automatically look up rates and, and give you an update on where the market stands for your scenario. And in this type of market where rates are changing on a, almost a daily basis, it's definitely something to, uh, to help you out a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's it, Aaron. We're gone um, on to another week. I'll see you guys on Wednesday, 5.30. I'll bring it on a top Bay Area realtor to talk a little bit about the you know, what's going on with Sacramento in the eyes of the Bay Area. And Friday, Elk Grove, I think it's 11.30, but I'm going to put an announcement on YouTube in the community tab tomorrow. Show up in Elk Grove. There's food. There's drink, there's talking. If you're a realtor and you want to learn how to do all this fun social media stuff, get out there, say hello. Let's take some selfies and do all that kind of fun stuff. Until next week, adios. Aaron? Have a good night. Guess what, guys? The video just ended. But don't worry. We have more videos just like that one right over there. And if you missed that red subscribe button during the course of the video, we got you covered right there. Hit that subscribe button. We promise to bring you some amazing content. We won't let you down. Now, if you're looking for a team in the Sacramento metro area to work with, we'd love to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. We always include a Zoom link down below. So book a time where we can talk to you a little one-on-one. -on -one, find out exactly what your real estate needs are.